I love this photo for lots of different reasons, um, but it also kind of is a bit of a metaphor for where we might be in the outdoors at the moment. <laughs> lots of change, um, the water kind of is getting quite high, <laughs> but we've still got our feet on the ground and the water is pretty crystal clear in some respects, um, so there is a way forward. Uh, Ben's given me a really strict timeline and I want to leave some time at the end for questions. Um, so I'm just really going to touch on a couple of key things um, and let you do some research afterwards or ask questions at the end. As Grant alluded to, he's gone through the history, but this is a massive um, period of change um, for all of us and particularly in the education sector. There's basically everything's up for review at the moment. Uh, the, one of the key reviews is the review of NCEA. Mm -hmm. Out of that came seven key changes. Um, one I'm going to mention today is around fewer larger achievement standards in schools. And this creates some issues for outdoor education in schools, in particular senior outdoor education classes, where if those classes are using achievement standards, they're sharing in most cases with phys ed. Uh, we go to fewer um, achievement standards in a phys ed matrix, uh, down to four, that sharing ability disappears. So that's a challenge for outdoor ed classes going forward. So opportunity, uh, and EONS is working really hard on this opportunity for outdoor education to try and get its own achievement matrix, I'm still within the phys ed and health um, learning area, but its own range of achievement standards. Uh, we're waiting on some key points to come out of the Ministry to see if we can do that, and also to get outdoor ed recognised as a subject, <coughs> to allow it to have its own matrix and be assessed both with achievement standards and unit standards. So that's a huge piece of work at the moment, and we've got a big group working on that, but there will be opportunities um, later down the track for people to feed into that. So this is our website and it will be a key place where you can um, make links with EONS if you've got thoughts around achievement standards for outdoor education. The second part of the review of qualifications is some work I'm doing for Skills Active around the review of unit standards that schools use across outdoor recreation, exercise, sport and recreation. Yes, it's quite a significant number <laughs> of standards in there. Um, I think my list got up to about 175. Um, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> there's lots of um, issues around uh, unit standards, how the credits don't match in with achievement standards, how schools use them and put their programs together. They've been up for review for a long time and it's a great opportunity now to try and put together a framework that really is fit for purpose for school use. Uh, it's a golden opportunity to reinforce a vocational pathway in outdoor recreation at level one and two leading into three and create some really good links into level three and four qualifications that now exist after the table to review of qualifications. Um, we're in the process of just deciding what that framework might look and uh, process for going forward and consultating and um, developing <coughs> and then looking at individual standards. <coughs> uh, so my challenge to you is to get involved if you have anything to do with level sta unit standards at level one, two and three. Uh, there'll be fabulous opportunities to join working groups, to <laughs> have your say and create something that's fabulous going forward. It's so enthusiastic about it. Okay? And I know there's a number of people who are already on the list in here, so anyone else as well. And consultation and feedback can look like anything <coughs> from just putting a few thoughts in an email to me um, or talking to me on the phone to actually getting involved in something and putting a lot of time into it. Uh, that will come out at some stage, um, both through our website and through the formal Skills Active process as well. Last little topic um, that I want to 
want to touch on today is school donations and fees, which has um, been pretty topical for a number of people in this room. And there's been a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding, uh, not necessarily misreporting because in some cases the, the press has just been reporting what people have been saying, but that what people have been saying isn't actually correct. So, the Education Act has existed for a long time. We could have had it up in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't changed. It's not going to change, probably. Uh, there's no appetite to change the, the concept that education in New Zealand should be free. And so, that's where this whole um, thing about donations and fees comes from. The fact that we have embedded in our legislation that education should be free unless we make some choices around sending our kids to private schools. As it is now, um, schools can't charge fees for a whole bunch of things, including camps, anything that's related to the curriculum, EOTC trips, they can't charge fees for those things. That doesn't match what practice now is. So they, schools are doing a whole lot of stuff they can't actually legally do now. And all of this is kind of boiled up in the media and the, um, the debate around this new um, donation scheme. And all of a sudden, even though schools have been, to been told for years that this is the case, um, they're all of a sudden getting a bit worried about it. So the case for next start of next year, if schools one to seven, uh, deciles one to seven, opt into the donation scheme, uh, that's their choice. They get $150 per student uh, into the operations grant at the start of the year. They spend that how they want, just as they do for all of the rest of the operations grant. Their choice about opting in. If they opt in, deciles one to seven, they then cannot charge, oh, cannot ask don for donations for any other activities, anything else from those parents except for there is now an exemption for camps. And a camp is a fairly wide criteria, um, it's anything overnight. So they can ask for a donation for anything overnight they do, if they've opted into the scheme. They can't charge fees for going on camp. They can't charge fees for uh, doing swimming lessons, driving down to swimming lessons, uh, trips to the museums. They can't charge fees and they really never have been able to. Um, that's not their practice at the moment though. Lots of schools will be charging fees. Uh, the situation is exactly the same um, for deciles 8 to 10. They can't charge fees for those things. They can ask for whatever donations they want to. And if a school hasn't opted into the donation scheme, exactly the same thing. Can't charge fees, they can ask for whatever donations they want. Uh, it's key to understand that if um, a parent doesn't pay a donation or only pays some of the donation, no one can be excluded from activities. Okay? So that's kind of the difference between a fee and a donation. So for example, Sport, Saturday sport, uh, winter tournament, all of those things are kind of optional for kids. Schools can charge a fee, you don't pay, you don't, school doesn't have to take you. Going on camp, curriculum based, um, <coughs> can't charge a fee, you can ask for a donation. If your parent doesn't pay, you can still go. And so you can probably understand that there's some um, challenges there for camp providers and for schools. There's also some opportunities, I think. Um, there's some challenges around EOTC activities as compared to camping overnight activities. Because uh, for some of those schools that opt in, uh, camps will actually be in a little bit of a privileged position and that, that will be the only thing that parents are asked to donate towards for the year. So that will look quite different for most parents. Caps might actually, for schools might actually find that parents are more willing to donate um, because it's just that one thing rather than something every couple of weeks. 
uh, other opportunities. I think um, we are, as both of Andrew and, and Grant have alluded to, that's a real period of change and this um, is one of those things that's going to really um, get schools looking at what they do um, and why they do it. And that is an opportunity, I think, for um, providers to work closely with schools around what value, really looking at what value um, uh, you're providing um, with those school students. You know, you have value, it's just really um, looking at how that relates to the curriculum and then how that is uh, sold or communicated to the parents um, so that they can see that donating to that, keeping those things going is really valuable. Uh, I think it might lead us in a path where we're looking at more localised curriculum, uh, more culturally appropriate um, activities that we're doing, uh, and really curriculum led, and also teacher really engaging with the teachers and those things becoming a bit more teacher led as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, eons. Um, so we've got a couple of things going on. One we've already got out and about, um, and that's a revisioning camp resource. And you can find this under resources on our tab. First one down, up in there, up top of the list. It's a fantastic resource, if I do say so myself. I have nothing to do with writing it. <laughs> yeah. um, but really, it would be great if everyone downloaded it for free, read it and talked about it with the schools that are um, working with you, if you're working with schools. Um, there's also some PLD um, for schools around embedding this resource. And then, hopefully starting Term 1 next year, we're working with uh, Merck and Craft Lab out of Auckland uh, to um, bottle up some of the stuff they do and bring that out into um, low decile primary schools for a starter uh, around um, local camping, crafting, uh, with the idea that teachers are educated and those activities get left with those schools so they can really get those um, basic experiences, low cost, local experiences. So that's um, PLD that will be coming out into schools. Um, but we're really open to talking to different providers about how um, we can support understanding in these areas. And we have two um, very part-time positions. Um, one, Sophie Hoskins, works around supporting um, schools uh, around areas of curriculum and curriculum advice, uh, but is also happy to talk to our providers, uh, whether they're EONS members or not. And um, I have a role in EOTC support, which is around answering questions about safety management systems and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Um, and we are both contactable uh, through here under somewhere. Oh, yeah, that's not quite sure. Yeah, start with yeah. Uh, the other thing that I should have said is there's some really good stuff in the ministry website around fees and donations that makes it really clear. It, um, the link to it is under media, it's one of the news stories that we're Questions? Just a quick point. Um, yep. I've just come from my son's graduation ceremony at his secondary school, and the schools are pushing that this new system. Um, the government is really funding a very basic education, which doesn't include a lot of the ATC or camps or those things. And, and when they do opt in for the donations, they need to find another way of trying to fund those things, which is tricky for the school. Absolutely. There's no denying that, um, that 
this is very tricky. And um, EONS next year will be spending a bit of time um, working with schools to try and work out, like a lot of schools are doing a lot of soul searching about whether to opt in, if they're decile one to um, seven and have that opportunity. Um, a lot of number crunching around what has to go, how they can juggle things around. Um, EONS, while supportive of the donation scheme, uh, are probably forming the opinion that it should be for all schools. Um, we're not quite sure why they um, they cut it where they did, and that the amount actually isn't enough. Um, and no one, no one would try and debate that there's enough money in the operations grant for a school. Uh, yeah, you're not going to find that argument anywhere, except perhaps. In terms of this, is a concern to me. Yeah. No doubt about your education camp, and there's we've got four schools at the moment that are all very, very shaky. Yep. Um, traditionally, students who did not wish to go to camp for whatever reason, it may have been health, it may have been emotional, it may have been medical, um, an alternative program was provided at school. Yep. Um, how does that model sit with people who choose not to make a donation toward camp? Doesn't. Doesn't? Yeah. The Ministry are really clear that the payment of none, some or all of their donation cannot be linked to that opportunity for the child to go. Despite them delivering the ATC requirements under a different non-camp. Correct. It's all about getting back to equity of the experience. Yeah. So we want to provide, and you know, I, I don't think anyone can would argue morally that we want to provide the same opportunities for everyone, regardless of what their parents earn um, and the, the financial challenges that might be at home. So. Awesome. Thank you, Fiona.